And with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our first panelist. It's Jan Emmanuel Deneve. Jan is uh, an amazing academic at uh, Oxford University. Uh, he has done all sorts of uh, crazy research into why you would want well-being at work. Uh, he's a Belgian economist and um, he is the KSI Fellow and Vice Principal of the Harris Manchester College at Oxford. He's best known for his research in economics of well-being, which has led to new insights into the relationship between well-being and income, productivity, economic growth and inequality. Denise is also the editor of the World Happiness Report. So Jan, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everyone on this panel, uh, dear colleagues and everyone else listening in. There are a, um, uh, a number of things I would like to cover in, in, a, in a handful of minutes. And I would like to start with providing a bit of a historical context. Uh, since uh, Charlotte kindly put me first on this list, it's probably up to me to provide a bit of a context to, to what we're about to talk about. And then delve into what I think are the channels of how uh, a four-day work week uh, would work and why it works in terms of maintaining and even increasing productivity. And then I'll end up with some of the challenges that I think we all need to think a bit uh, more about. Uh, and I'll finish on that in the next five or six minutes. So I want to start by saying um, the following, a bit of historical context. And um, the important thing is just to look at the data first of how many hours we're all working these days. And uh, you may or may not be surprised to know that since the 1970s in the US and the U UK, we haven't seen a meaningful reduction in hours worked at all. Um, we have, uh, so we're, I looked up the, the, the numbers the other day, and we are at about 1,750 hours uh, a year, which translates to well, well above 30 hours a week on average for people in the US and UK. And that hasn't moved very much at all since the 1970s. If you look like France and Germany, if you look at countries like France and Germany, you'll find that they're, they're working about 1,500 hours uh, a year. So that's a meaningful difference. And you see, if you look at the trend over the years, you find that that is quite a bit, uh, it is biz there has been a progressive trend on that front. And in fact, when I think back at the last meaningful global change in terms of the working week, you already have to go back to the 40s and the 50s when we reduced uh, the, um, uh, the working week from, from five and a half to five. So I remember my grandparents still talking about uh, having to work on Saturday morning, mostly pointless, <laughs> even they admitted to that at the time. And then it was reduced to a, a, a two day weekend, a five day working week. But that's the 40s and in some countries even the 30s. And so it's a bit sad that it takes visionary leaders like Andrew and Charlotte and others to sort of try themselves to move the needle on the progressive front in terms of the work week. And so there's a lot to be said about that. Um, one person, a historical person, who'd be awfully surprised to find out that we're still working five days a week rather than much less would be the eminent economist John Maynard Keynes. People on this panel will be very familiar with what I'm about to say, but it, 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 we need to keep people, we need to remind people over and over again of his, uh, of, his, uh, of his work and his thinking. In the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes thought that 100 years hence, uh, we'd be working about uh, 15 hours a week. In other words, a two-day work week. And so for him, the notion of a four-day work week would be uh, rather a no-brainer and probably still way behind on the progressive arc, uh, so the labor versus leisure time allocation. Now, John Maynard Keynes was obviously quite wrong on his prediction about how many hours we'd be working a week, but he was very right on our productive gains over the same period. So he expected that we'd grow about eight times in the, the next 100 years, thanks to technological change and uh, other productivity gains, and he was spot on on that front. So somebody who's so right on productivity gains, how can he get it so wrong on how we would translate these productivity gains into, um, into hours worked? And here, I think there is potential to do much, much better indeed. Um, and the reason why I think a four-day work week can work really well is because there's channels running from uh, working less hours through work-life balance onto employee well-being and engagement and then onto productivity. And so the reason why I'm raising this particular channel between employee well-being, uh, four-day work week, improving work-life balance, improving employee well-being and onto productivity is because my own research has focused in on the link between employee well-being and productivity. And I think that's key in understanding why in places like Perpetual Guardian, you'll find that a moving to a four-day work week has not reduced uh, total output and increased, obviously, productivity on a day-by-day uh, day -day basis. 
So let me um, tell you, uh, uh, spend a minute or so on the specific piece of research that I think is that special key that allows us to help explain why a four-day work week can uh, uh, improve productivity and maintain total output even though we're working a day less a week. Um, we worked for over four years in a massive collaboration with British Telecom where we essentially pulsed all of their call center employees every week on how uh, happy they were feeling. And, what we've, and then we matched that with all the performance data about the, the BT call center employees. And it's quite scary to the extent to which we've got a granular level performance data about these, uh, about these workers. And the key, the headline result is actually pretty straightforward. What we find is that if, you're, if workers are in a good mood, they are 13% more productive uh, as measured through weekly sales as compared to a week where they're in less a good mood. So that's it, and I, I, I like to insist, this is a causal statement. Um, so we went out of our way and it took many, many, many years to get to this point, but this is causal inference. Um, so it's uh, evidence at the highest level. So, there, so we now know there's a causal link between uh, employee well-being and uh, productivity. One quick point to note out, uh, to note, which I think is very relevant um, to the general notion of, of the four-day work week is that what we found is that people, workers that were happier, weren't working more hours. They were or taking shorter breaks. What they were doing is being more efficient with the time at hand. So what we saw is they were doing more calls per hour and converting more of these calls into sales. So it was the social and emotional skills, the social intelligence also, that was uh, heightened thanks to higher levels of well-being. Now, why am I zooming in on that particular link between employee well-being and productivity? Because I think it's a crucial aspect within the larger channel moving from a four-day week to uh, uh, higher productivity. And that's, as we've noticed, um, as our colleagues uh, in New Zealand uh, have, have shown in the pre-post trial of, uh, of Perpetual Guardian's uh, uh, experiment, is that I think that what, for me, the main takeaway was the big jump in appreciation of work-life balance. So I think if my memory doesn't fail me, prior to the experiment at Perpetual Guardian, it was just below 50% of satisfaction with work-life balance. Post the uh, uh, introduction, it went up to well above 70% in terms of appreciation of work-life balance. And I'm looking at that particular statistic as, as a key metric in that channel of explaining how and why uh, we can actually maintain uh, total output, increase productivity, even though we were working a day less. So that's critical to me. Now, that's just one channel that channel between um, um, four-day working week, work-life balance, onto employee engagement and productivity. There's two other channels that I can, uh, that I'll I really want to mention for firm performance. Going to a four-day work week makes you a more attractive employer. So you'll have more talent that you'll be attracting, and as a result, uh, a, a bigger talent pool. On the other side of the, of the life uh, course of an employee is obviously um, how, um, uh, uh, turnover. And so what we find is that people um, uh, with higher well-being and, and mainly thanks to a four-day work week, they are uh, staying uh, much longer in the job. And that is an underestimated positive impact on companies' bottom line that should not be underestimated at all. So there's a number of ways in which um, employ, um, the four-day work week will improve employee well-being and that will then drive um, um, uh, productivity. Now, we're, I'm the one who's linking for their work week to uh, employee well-being and productivity, but there's also other side benefits that I think my colleagues on this panel will talk about, including, of course, um, that uh, working uh, less uh, hours obviously means less of a commute, uh, more spending more time with other people, less traffic, uh, and we know how bad traffic congestion is for pollution. We know how bad commuting is for well-being. In fact, every minute gained, if you want, is the equivalent of a dollar gain in terms of psychological value. Uh, and, and we have some data to back that up. So that's really rather important. Um, I want to make, um, if, I, if you bear with me for another minute or two maybe, I want to um, move towards a conclusion around um, how I think the future of work is looking and how important the four-day work week is for thinking about the future of work. Um, would you believe that last year, 30% of the, of the globe population noted that they were experiencing anxiety and uh, stress, so a whole host of negative emotions that you wouldn't want to be associated with. And that the same statistic from the Gallup World Poll on anxiety and stress stood at 24%, so that's a whole, a whole host less 10 years ago. So the world's population has become much more anxious and worried uh, about their lives. No, and remember, this was against an, uh, an improving uh, backdrop and well before COVID-19. 
So this is economic growth is doing well and people are getting more anxious. And my, my theory is that um, this is partially driven about expectations about the future of work. People are not excited about what's ahead of them. Most people do tend to lose from the future of work and do will not gain from the productivity gains of technological change and automation and the like. And so what are, what are governments, what are senior leaders uh, tend to focus in on, on to try and help people and hopefully uh, um, make it work uh, for the vast majority of people? They are not the most exciting type of projects. It'll be, they'll talk about massive reskilling programs. I heard, overheard people saying at Davos, or they talk about promoting flexible working and gig economy type jobs which may work well for businesses, but it doesn't work well for the well-being of, of, of employees. They talk about universal basic income, which may be a good idea, but isn't very exciting because ultimately it is some kind of handout and does not allow for the agency uh, that work allows. And then in the Middle East, they talk about migrant labor to try uh, and improve matters for the future of work. What all of these current sort of proposals to deal with issues with the future of work have in common is that they're not particularly exciting for people and not something to look forward to. And so hence why I think it's so important, uh, both bottom up and top down, for policymakers and business leaders to really look at the four day work week as an exciting proposal to look forward to rather than the anxiety uh, that we currently see in the statistics, even in good times. Uh, it's because people anticipate bad times around the corner. I want to finish on what I think are three challenges that all of us, the experts in the room, the practitioners, and especially everybody listening in, uh, need to discuss and think about. And the first one is, and I'll be very, very brief. The first one is, um, can, we, can you help us, uh, Ashley and myself, the academics, help us raising the level of evidence from correlational to causal evidence? What I think we need is um, blue chip companies um, doing randomized control trials, testing this and showing uh, uh, the strong evidence that we find in places like uh, Perpetual Guardian and smaller scale trials and pre and post that type of exercise. So I think there's a real case to be made and we need, we're, we're in conversation with a number of large organizations, but I think the time is right to do something much bigger and take the evidence to the next level. The second challenge is um, that I'm often thinking about, I'm not quite sure, so I, I would love our panel to discuss this at some point if we can, is the relative importance of sort of top-down versus bottom-up initiatives with regards to four-day work week. So Charlotte and Andrew are what I call a bottom-up approach. Visionary leaders uh, trialing it themselves, taking the risk of doing it no matter what and, and finding out it works well. The top-down approaches, Jacinda Ardern and other uh, policy leaders, perhaps coordinating policy around a move uh, to a four-day work week uh, as a whole for a society at large. So that, that relative importance of what would be the best possible way of getting this done, and what are the pros and cons uh, either way. And then finally, uh, perhaps a somewhat sobering note, um, and I know that Andrew and Charlotte have have uh, pronounced have come out on this particular point recently as well. Uh, and I'll, and I'll, and the story here is a very personal one. I was uh, part of senior leadership, uh, senior management teams that I that I am part of. I overheard somebody saying, "Great, we should look into the four day work week for our staff." Um, I hear that they may do as much work as they normally do in a week, but we can pay them eighty percent for doing it. And so. Andrew and Charlotte have this notion of 100% um, uh, um, pay and 80, uh, for 100% work for 80% uh, and 80% of the time for 100% of the pay. And I'm worried that there's a number of, of, of sharks out there who may try and leverage the COVID-19 situation and other difficult situations to try and leverage the research about people can be more efficient and, um, and, be more, and do potentially more in four days uh, as much as they would otherwise in five. But think about this in terms of cost cutting rather than sort of um, empowering people to do a good job. So that I'll leave, that out, leave this out there. I hope that this can be addressed at some point in the discussion later. Thank you very much. Yeah, and um, very good points and apologies uh, to everyone for uh, the technical issues that I was having earlier on. It's, uh, it's obviously not great when you were meant to be the technical guru in New Zealand. Um, but you mentioned um, the mindset of people and do you think that um, when we were moved into obviously forced lockdown around the world and we had, to, um, we had to identify with new technology in order to interact, in uh, order to transact, um, that we, we will start to question the simple uh, things that we took for granted in the, the, the Monday to Friday 
you know, nine to five working week. Do you think there's enough momentum to actually get us across the line and really start to look and address at some of those things that are now important to us, not only as individuals, uh, not only as a family, uh, but probably more universal to your point as a, as a global nation. Do you think we've got momentum to do that? It's a great question. I'm, I'm a bit of a pragmatist, and so I don't quite believe in big revolutions, but I think there's an evolution here that's, go, that's happening. What we have now is um, a proof of the fact that flexible working works, or at least for the people that can work uh, from home. And that is still a vast majority of people. Um, and so what I think we've, so it will be very difficult for managers now to respond to somebody asking, can I work uh, Friday afternoon or, or, or Wednesday morning from home? It'll be very difficult for them to say no, because we've just shown we can. Um, and so my sense is there's the opportunity. So um, um, as was the case with, with Perpetual Garden, it's about empowering people and have them take the initiative to think about their working week of five days, reorganize it, rearrange it. And the, the ICT possibilities like Zoom, which we're using now, um, that we weren't using <laughs> six months ago, is these kind of technologies now that everybody's aware of and familiar with will, I think, allow for that reorganization of the work week in, in teams. Um, and thus, I think, will help accelerate a move towards uh, potentially for their work week um, because of the efficiency gains of these work from home type practices. And cutting out the commute, frankly, <laughs> It's interesting, actually, um, and uh, you know, just before we move on to um, to hear from Andrew, um, uh, you know, when I spoke to people before COVID, everybody was like, "We're very busy." You know, we're that's the that, that's the default thing, isn't it? That we're very busy. Um, but interestingly enough, when we moved into the COVID world, because we didn't have to commute, because we didn't have to fly, we were literally jumping to your point from Zoom to Zoom, webinar to webinar. Microsoft Teams, Blue Jeans, all these different types of technology that a lot of things were already in existence, um, mm -hmm. but we just didn't maybe adopt or utilize as, as maybe as much as we possibly could. Um, so I absolutely agree that I think the transition uh, mm -hmm. into the, the digital world, uh, the virtual world, uh, and also then the, the rethinking and the reshaping of the way that we do work. Um, is shifting, I think, towards the better. So um, <clears throat> thank you for your insights. And um, it's really great to have you, obviously, as part of the, part of the conversation. Um, and really do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule.